what a weekend. <laughs> a dry race and a wet race, a day race and a night race. Yeah, it was bloody um identical um identical to the year before because um we had like exactly the same with the weather like we had a we had a dry race and then we tried to start the second race and it turned into a wet race so it was pretty... <laughs> it's too expensive. so how do you prepare for that because um, I'm, i mean you don't get to practice in all those conditions you just most of your practices and qualifying is in dry or was well, yeah that's it. yeah yeah and, and i mean all, all that all of my ride time like nearly all of it's in the in the draw, I guess it's the same for everyone, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard. You got to try to just adapt as quick as you can in the short amounts, like, as quick as you can. I guess that's all you can do. Yep. Yeah. True. Well, listen. <laughs> uh, let's run through. Have a quick look. Uh, race one. So, I, I when I watched the video, and I, you know, obviously I wasn't down there. I saw it on video. Have you watched the race, by the way? No, I haven't watched the races. No, I haven't watched these ones. Um, we had. What do we have? Uh, you had a pretty good start in race one because I think you qualified fourth, didn't you? Fourth or fifth? Fourth. Yeah, I uh, qualified fifth. Yeah, fifth. Um, I think crew was crew was fourth. I was fifth. Yep. Right. Yeah. So you got up to like a pretty good start. Got up to fourth and lap one, yep. and then uh, I was watching it. You ran wide on turn two, and uh, I think a couple of people snuck inside you there. Your entry speed was really high into turn two on that particular one. <laughs> Which, uh, I was impressed with the entry speed, that's for sure. Um, but then you had a rat, red flag on lap on lap two. I think there was a crash in turn one. Uh, Walters crashed. Yep. Um, so then you had a part two. You had a ten lap race. Crew got a great start. That he he did way better this time than he did at Phillip Island. That's for sure. Yep. Um, yeah. So what was your take on the race overall? Yeah, I mean, so obviously the uh, the race we started with initially had the first start, and I think we were only a couple of laps in, and it had the red flag. Mm. Um, it actually kind of worked out in one way; it worked out good for me, and in another way, it worked out bad. So it was good in the way that we were able to restart again because it gave me another chance to try to make a better start. Mm. Um, first, the initial, the first start wasn't. Um, wasn't as good as I would have liked to have done. So when we restarted the race, I think I made a bit better start, got a bit better track position early on. So that meant that I could run with those um, few guys that were in front of me. I sort of like tagged onto them pretty quickly and was able to sort of just just sort of hanging on the back of those guys. Yeah. Um, but um, the and the way that that race panned out, they they seem to have um, they seem to be able to get down to the the lap time like a little bit easier than what I could. I was sort of uh, I struggled a little bit. Um, I, I did a my, my best time was on lap two was a twenty nine point five. I think the other guys were maybe a tenth or two quicker than me um, there. But then like there's the next sort of the middle of the race. It's sort of I found that I struggled to maintain that speed. The other guys always had a few extra tenths on me during the race, so they sort of like put a bit of a gap into me. Yeah. But the good thing about the the good thing about our bike and our setup was that we had really good um, um, like pace with the with the tire towards the end of the race. So um, <clears throat> I felt like I was getting strong towards the end of the race, and um, you know, particularly Josh and Harry on the Ducatis, they were kind of um, struggling just a little bit more um, come the last part of the race. But that was where it sort of didn't pan out in my favour because we had the restart meant that the race had been reduced to 10 laps. Yeah. So um, I felt like if we were to run the full race, like a full 13-lap race all in one go, um, it would have played into my favour maybe a little bit better. So, um, yeah, that's sort of – I ended up finishing uh, fourth in the race, um, but I felt like I probably had a little bit of pace towards the end to maybe, maybe ended up getting myself into second place, you know, ahead of – um, Josh and Harry, just because I felt like uh, the bike was a little bit stronger right towards the end on the tyre. Well, you could see that in the times. Like, you know, mm. you were only uh, 0.285. I've just got all the sheets up here. 0.285 behind Harry, mm. um, you know, which was nothing on the track. You could see it right at the finish there. And uh, yep. I think Josh Waters was only just ahead as well. So there was definitely something in it, you know, three more yeah. laps. Well, that's it. Like that, uh, if you look at the last couple of laps of the race, like, um, uh josh i think josh like lost a heap of time in those last two laps like he he went out he's he's you know from from during the race he was doing like 
I think, you know, sort of high 29s. And then those last two laps, he was, he second last lap was out to a high one minute 30. And his yeah. last lap was a, was a low one minute 30. Whereas my, my last lap was a, was a high 29. So um, like I put, I gained a lot of time on those guys just in those last two laps. Um, and that's where I felt like, you know, had we been able to just run the, run the full distance, maybe those extra few laps would have, would have come in handy, but, um, yeah, it wasn't to be, but ultimately it was a pretty close finish. Like I said, it was only a few tenths between us right at the end. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Cause I always want to watch 13 laps. Like you look at, you know, world Superbike, and you know, I don't know if you watched world Superbike last weekend, but, um, with top rack being almost, it was four point something seconds behind, um, Bulaga. And then he then he passed him, you know what I mean. Yep. So, so that whole tire strategy seems to really come into play in the longer races. I think they're doing twenty two or twenty four laps or something like that. Why is why don't they do more laps in ASBK? Um, so the I think the main the, the main reason for it is um, fuel capacity. So um, we're, we're in World Superbike. I mean, they can modify the fuel tank and they run a larger. They run a larger tank on the bikes, yeah. um, which it, it doesn't doesn't um, appear obvious to the naked eye because the way that they run the fuel tank, they actually run um, the extra part of the tank underneath the underneath the seat. Oh yeah, yeah, it go, go, goes down and it goes underneath the seat. So um, I don't know what the difference in capacity is from a stock fuel tank to what they can run in World Superbike, but that lets them you know be able to do more distance. Uh, whereas we we run completely standard, um, a completely standard tank with no modification to it. So, um, I don't, uh, again, I don't know what the lead is, what the capacity is exactly, but um, but I think that is kind of sort of the limiting factor um, for our races. I I don't think, <clears throat> I think maybe on our bike we might be able to get an extra couple of laps in um, on top of what we're doing now. But I think with the Ducatis, I think they're pretty maxed out with the distance as it is. I don't think they can do too much more um, than what they're doing now. So that's sort of, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, just fuel capacity. Yeah. So you, that's why when they get a red flag, then they just subtract the laps you've done and you've got to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Like they can't, they can't make the race any longer than it is because otherwise you will have bikes stopping and not finishing the race. (laughs) Yeah. With, With the red flag, the, why do you have any understanding why they don't do, you know, last position on the track as the grid mm. position? Why do they go back to the original grid position? Do you know? Um oh to be honest, look, I'm not I'm not actually really too sure about that. I, I haven't um haven't even read up on the rules as to what the what the exact situation with that is because I'm sure there are certain circumstances where they do run off of uh the you know track your last track lot of track position rather than you know the actual uh than the actual like qualifying grid as such but i think because yeah i'm not 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 too sure not not actually too sure on that one yeah i'd have to look through the rule book and work out what the difference is yeah it's mm. interesting the, the other one is i always wonder if they bring the red flag out too soon you know it's like you know, in the bigger classes, you know, WSBK and MotoGP mm. tend not to red flag it as much, whereas it feels like ASBK, the red flag gets whacked out quite frequently. Maybe that's yeah, true. Yeah, that, that, that's true. It's it's a hard one, I suppose. Um, I think that maybe maybe in the case of World Superbike, they have so many marshals, um, you know, at each turn point yeah. that they have, a, they have a really, they have a, a, better, a better chance to be able to clear the incident, you know, particularly if the rider's not hurt and they just need to get the bike out of the way, um, then they then they can sort of do that. Whereas definitely with our events, they're they're pretty slim on on you know marshals at each each point. So um, I my understanding is that you know they they have a marshal there that can sort of you know wave the flag or you know provide that information to you, but they don't have enough people there to just be able to go out and collect to the bike and you know bring bring everything back in again. Um, and look, I think that you know, in the past, they probably have just let races run on, and maybe I think things are sort of like you know they're probably going more on the cautious side because um yeah. you know uh, they whilst it might be um it might might be a slim chance that they they have another accident you know in exactly the same spot, but 
<laughs> it's uh, it, it's not going to be a nice uh, nice incident if we have a, a rider crash and you know land in, in, onto another bike. So um, yeah. I do think that it's the way that they're doing. It. I, I would personally prefer it to be a red flag and just restart it again, then then leave it to chance and there possibly being a, another a, another incident and maybe something worse. It makes sense. They because uh, I, I you know you play back the world level ones. They um have got medical crew at each at each area as yeah. well. Whereas here, like I noticed when Herfoss and Glen Allen crashed, they got up and it was obvious that they weren't injured. So yep. there's no medical intervention required and they, you know, the race kept going. But um with that first one at turn one, that's probably gonna be a fast crash too. So uh Yeah, well that that one of, of Walter's like I'm pretty sure he like he's broken broken a bone, possibly his collarbone, I think it was. Yeah. Um yeah, but but exactly that. Like they they have to red flag. Like in a situation like that where the rider is injured, that they, they have to red flag and they have to get the bikes off as quickly as they possibly can because they have to bring the medical, you know, to that rider. Um, yeah. Again, whereas with World Superbike, like you said, you know, they've got medical already like out out on the on the edges of the track, so they can they can just attend to that rider straight away um, and possibly even move them. You know, off uh, out of the out of the gravel trap or out of the out of the crash zone, whilst the race is you know still happening, so they can still clear it and um, attend to that rider and keep the race running. You know, yeah. When they, I imagine when they send out you know the email looking for uh, uh, you know people to man the uh, the gravel traps and things like that, they would be sending people away. Whereas we're struggling to get people. So yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think you look in well, Superbike or you know GP, even like uh, people are, would be you know super keen to 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 do, to do that to do that kind of event. But yeah, for sure, for hours we're always, we're always trying to trying to gain as many people as we can. Aussies, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, okay. What do we got? Because uh, Josh Waters was doing one twenty nine point five. I think that was one of the times I saw there. Uh, Crew, now what did I get in here? Oh yeah, now crew got up to second in lap one, and then he ended up, um, you know, cleaning up on lap nine or uh, towards the end of the race, and he passed. So great job on his part. Um, you ended up, if we run through the sheet, uh, we had Josh Waters came second, uh, half a second behind, then Harrison Voigt, and then yourself, boy. Like I said, point two eight five of a second. So 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 close. It was very cool. Yeah. It's a bit frustrating sometimes when you're so close to it, <laughs> when you're so close to the podium like that because um yep. yeah I mean you, you you do your best the whole race you if you you know physically you, you and mentally you try your best throughout the whole race and then to, <laughs> to miss out by a couple of tenths at the end it's always a bit frustrating yeah um, but uh, but that's racing and uh, that's why you know it's it'll be it'll be um wouldn't wouldn't be so rewarding if 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 the challenge wasn't there you know when, when so when you do have a win or you or you do get a result well then uh, obviously it's yeah it's very rewarding because uh because it is tough to be able to get there <laughs> yeah the high is higher for the person slightly in front too <laughs> yeah exactly yeah 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 there's a behind yeah um, absolutely okay we go to uh, uh race two mm. the start i thought you know, you guys made a brilliant start there and it was wet too. Um, so you took off, we get to the second corner and it's wet on slicks <laughs> and everyone, you know, has got their feet out and their hands up and running wide and everything. Um, how much change do you have to do when you go back? Cause you've, you've gone out on a dry setup, you've come back and it's not as simple as just whacking a set of wets on it. You know, how much change have you got to make to your bike? Yeah, so look, we're in a pretty fortunate position that we have two bikes set up there. So, so when uh, as the, as the evening progressed, there we were the team was keeping an eye on the on the weather forecast, so um, they could sort of see that there was a, probably a high chance that we we're going to have rain for that second race. So they just made the spare bike, they just turned that into a wet wet bike. They changed the suspension um, and obviously changed the changed the wheels to the wet tires. Um, and also adjust the electronics as well, um, just to try and dial a little bit of power out of it and make it a little bit more easy to ride. Um, so it's not so aggressive. Um, but they, that's the biggest things really. It's just the tires, the suspension, soften the suspension up. Um, because you don't, you're not, you know, during the wet, in the wet, you're, you're typically, you know, 10 to 15 seconds slower than you would be in the dry. So the, the force that you're putting through the bike is, is significantly less. Um, you're not braking as hard, you're not accelerating as hard, so the suspension can be softer. 
Um, and then, yeah, obviously just the electronics there, try and take a bit of power out of it, make it a bit easier to ride. So that bike was already set up, ready to go um, in the in the pits. Um, and it was just a matter of, you know, the way that that race panned out, we, we did go out. We started on the dry bike with the slick tyres. Um, uh, it Just the timing of it was like couldn't have been any worse, I suppose. They, they actually started the race right as the as the rain just sort of started coming down. Yeah. Um and so yeah, so we 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 got to we got through turn one and down into turn two and it was actually already wet there. So um yeah, I think I, w- I went in there fast enough for what it would be, you know, fast as you would go in there if it was dry. But as I started braking, I realized that it, <laughs> I realized it was wet. So I blew the whole turn. I just ended up running real wide. I had a yeah. bit of a slide from the rear and um, I realized that it was quite wet there. So, and it was only the next turn, um, you know, I ran wide, a bunch of people went up the inside and then everyone had their hand up. So, um, yeah, they called the race immediately then because then the track was actually quite wet um, and everyone just came back to the pits and, for my yeah, like I said, for my my situation it was very easy. Just jump on the on the spare bike. We actually, they actually only have, I think it's only five minute turnaround from when you come into the pit lane to to going back out on track again. So it's very short. Um, I do believe some people uh, had um, had only one bike, so they you know to try to make adjustments to their bike. It's not really ideal. Yeah. Um, you know, lucky to even get a set of wheels in. You know, what I mean, swap the wheels out, get another set of wheels in. Yeah. Um, and and so just to, just to make note of that, that that was my circumstance last year because we had um, you know, the previous year we had uh, we had an issue with the the main bike, so I was down to it to one bike, and the circumstances were identical. So I came into the pits um, on a dry bike, had the team flat out in, in five minutes trying to convert it to a wet bike. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just simply can't make it in 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 five minutes. You just can't make it into a wet bike. So yeah, I'm sure some of the guys that were on a you know, I, I only had one bike for the for the weekend. Then, um, yeah, they certainly weren't in the most I- ideal circumstance. But uh, yeah, we're very fortunate to be able to run two bikes. Just jump in straight back out on the other bike and <laughs> go go and try and learn how to ride in the rain. <laughs> Ear luxury. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. We never got to practice out there and and uh, in the wet. And the other one, other thing I noticed, like I just look at the sheets and. I noticed they had the temperatures on the race results and the, mm. the, the temperature of the track in race one was 33.9 degrees. So it was, you know, it was cloudy. It was 22 degrees or something ambient temperature, but 33.9, so 34 degrees and it was 24.1 in the wet temp. So you got a 10 degree drop as well in, yep. in temperature. Um, how much do all these things contribute to you changing strategy or do you just go out in the race and, you know, follow the same strategy? Yeah, look, I mean, that it's a big change for, for, for the wet race because, I mean, um, the mindset changes because, because the, like you said, you've got things like such as the temperature where, you know, we, we race the first race sort of in the, in the afternoon, in the evening, yeah. um, still a bit of temperature in the track. Uh, come the night race, it was uh, so it was it was dark, less less track temp. Um, uh, you know, it's wet. the The surface there is the the track um, is quite a sort of a low grip track. There, it doesn't the the bitumen doesn't have a whole lot of grip in it anyway. Um, and it has uh, it has been resurfaced in parts of the track. So um, some parts of the track do have a lot of grip, does have a lot of grip in it. Other parts is kind of like still the old surface and it's very, very slippery there. So more than anything, it's just like the mentality changes to being surviving and just trying to finish the race and get some points because uh, like we've seen with some of the riders, you know, like it's good and well to be fast and, um, Mm. you know, racing and trying to challenge for a podium place. But, um, you know, it's it's so easy to to have a crash and and to to lose a whole bunch of points. Like it's just... um, Yeah, it's a pretty pretty tricky track um, with the inconsistencies there to be able to be super accurate. So uh, I think uh, uh, the chances of having a crash are pretty high. Um, yeah, so from my from my point of view, the mentality was just um, try to try to get a feeling with the bike as quickly as I possibly could because you need to have a good sensation of of, of traction to be able to you know keep the bike upright. Um, so uh, there's a small element of having to you know push the bike to a certain extent to just try and get that feeling with it. Um, but once I sort of acquired that feeling of traction, then that was as bad as far as I went um, with in terms of pushing the bike. 
uh, and uh, and and more than then just trying to finish the race. So um, yeah, wasn't a wasn't a fantastic result. I think I might have finished ninth, but um, but yeah. for me, you know, ninth and gaining some points was was certainly better than trying to race against the other guys when I wasn't comfortable and then possibly having a crash. You know. Yeah, you need you've got to have a long term view over you. You know, early in the season too, we're only in the second round. Yeah, that's it. And look, like the bottom line is if 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 I was good enough and I was confident enough, for sure, I would have been up there at the pointy end and would have had a better result. But I wasn't, so I did what I could, and that was just, that was the best result that I could get then and there. Um, and for me, like I said, um, the main thing is is just getting up some points so that way, then you know. Um, we think about the championship more than more than the individual race, you know. Like, a, like yeah. there's a fine line in that one to to get zero points, or we just score on a few points. So, <laughs> yeah. I oh, yeah. If you go, we go through the results. Um, you know, Josh Waters won. He actually won by a fair margin. It really broke out at the end in three point six seconds or something over yeah. Brock Pearson. Uh, Max Dale for the uh, third crew came fourth. Harry fifth. Uh, Brian Staring sixth and then right down i think you come in ninth so yeah it was just you know a matter of you can see it a matter of getting points and those points are pretty important so uh uh good long-term view yeah 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 like i said like i mean look if i had been able to i for sure would have been further up the field but for me i i, I wasn't yeah, was lacked a bit of confidence there and just didn't have the <laughs> didn't have the go to <laughs> go any faster the like, more I was going, so uh, for people who've never ridden it, like you know, we've ridden at the at the school around there in the wet, and uh, you know, on the beamers on race techs. Man, in the daytime, like you know, going under the bridge and turn eight. Oh my god, it's like it, it is a survival mentality in many ways because yeah. it's so touchy. You know, you the, the edge when it comes, it comes fast. Yep, exactly. That's it, and that that that. That's the thing. That there's a couple of sections on track. I think it might be like turn three and that section you're talking about, turn turn eight. Yeah. Um, that seems to be more like the old surface there, and that is just so slick, so slippery, and and exactly that. You 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 can be one second you can have a good feeling there and feel like everything's fine, yeah. and, and then the next second you might have just added a little bit more throttle or tried to steer the bike a little bit more, and it just goes away from you so fast and. And it will go away that quick that you have no no time to react and catch it. So, um, yeah, it's a bit scary, to be honest. <laughs> How, how's turn five now? Because I remember, you know, we used to ride around there and there would be that, you know, if it might have rained and then dried out, you'd get this river across turn five. That's pretty much gone. What's turn five in that area like for you guys? Yeah, hundred percent. So, like that, because that was a, a a fair bit of a problem area um, in the past. But they've, they've, I think they've worked it a couple of times to try to, you know, maybe two or three times to try and get it right. And it seems like it's okay now. Um, that part of the track is just like uh, it's it's it has been resurfaced. So it, the 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 bitumen there is actually quite grippy. Yeah. Um, but in but in terms of the the drainage there, like the the water doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to have any sort of rivers or any sort of standing water more so than anywhere else on the track so it's actually quite quite fine there now yep um overall so i've got the results from the round so we had you know josh came first with 46 points over the two uh over the two uh, our two races crew got second you know great job that that's his his starts were way better this time you know both times uh, both races 42 points brock on 35 third harry Fourth, Max fifth. We run down Mike, uh, Mr. Mike Jones, eighth. This one, this was uh, uh, that last race. Yeah, that bit you, that one, <laughs> the wet one. But overall, <laughs> uh, going pretty well. You've got Josh leading with 109.5 points. Crew on second with 84 points. Harry Voigt, 82 th uh, third. Brock Pearson, fourth on 71.5. And yourself on fifth. 61.5. So how do you feel about the season so far? Yeah, so obviously the first two rounds starting off like round round position wise like I think the first one I was 7th overall this second round now 8th overall like they to me if I was if I was going to, to, to be brutally honest it's pretty terrible. Um I mean I you know I'm I'm ex I expect to be up the the pointy end, you know, I'm turn up to the weekends 
wanting to to win or at least be on the podium. So to be so far back isn't um is certainly outside my expectation. But um but it's a strange one because you look at the overall round uh, series points and um to be fifth fifth in the championship is um is uh is strange because the fir- the actual ra- the the finishing position from those two rounds has been um you know quite poor so uh to be able to be fifth in the championship like and that's the whole thing is to focus on the championship and um i think is a good good place to be um especially because i feel like these f- the first three rounds for us were would were always going to be probably the most challenging of the of the year mm. um Whilst I like Phillip Island and I like Sydney Motorsport Park, um, they're ones that I just don't seem to have any advantage or any sort of edge over the comp- over my competitors there. So, you know, these next few rounds that we go to, we go to Queensland Raceway and Morgan Park. Yeah, um, I'd I'd like to be able to have a bit better evaluation of how my championship stands after those couple of rounds because I feel like they're they're my tracks, you know, like obviously being a Queenslander and those circuits being in Queensland, I've done a, done a lot of laps there and um, I feel like I'm going to have a bit more of an edge over the other guys there. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, to be in fifth place, um, you know, isn't terrible and I think that, like, in theory, I should be able to gain a few more spots back after the next couple of rounds. So, um yeah, I mean, it's a hard one because you always want to be further up. Unless you're first, you're not really happy. But um, but yeah. I think realistically, overall for the championship right now at this point in time, not a bad start. Um, definitely got work to do and I will be making sure that I do everything that I feel like I possibly can in these next couple of races to um, try and claw back some of those points. Do you get any testing or practice between now and the next round? Yes, yeah, so we're... Right? Yeah, so Queensland Raceway is the next round. That's um, the end of the end of uh, April, um, and so we're actually doing a, a two day test there at QR um, next week. I think it's Monday, Tuesday next week. So um, it, it will be a it will be a test that uh, it's not a private hire. It, it'll be with um, uh, a bunch of the other the other teams, and that will be there. So it's not like we'll get, have an advantage in terms of um, track time, but. Um, but it's a chance for us to, uh, you know, we've already got a setup that works quite well there. So it'd be a chance for me just to get get up to speed there on that bike and then see if we can find, um, you know, any improvements, you know, over those couple of days. And more than anything is just for me to um, make sure that I'm consistent there so that way then when we turn up for the races, we can just get straight into it and, and get down to business. Uh, very cool. We're... Uh... We'll be following closely. See how you go. Um, I got a, uh, you know, I've been talking to people, particularly at the school and all that, and, and and a couple of questions came up. Is it okay? You got a minute to answer a couple of questions? Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. The strength of the Yamaha versus the Ducati, like mm. you know, I, I was watching in the dry race and it's trying to answer the question just by watching and observing. And what what I saw was, what it seemed to be better entry speed, kind of mid corner speed, that first half of the corner seemed yeah. to favor the Yamahas. And then the back half of the corner seems to favor the Ducatis. So have I got it right or wrong? And what are your thoughts about the differences and strengths of the two? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's about right. Um, I mean, the, the Yami definitely um, seems to be quite like it. For me personally, I find that I can be quite strong on the break and that corner entry um, and mid-turn. Um, in saying that, that's it's always going to be a trade-off though. Like if you're fast on the way in, you're typically typically going to find that you're a little bit slower on the way out. So I wonder if that that's just a natural thing that maybe the Ducati is a little bit slower going in but sort of sets up better for a better run on the exit. Oh. And it might be something that's just a riding style or something that I could change I could maybe steady up a little bit on the entry and try and focus on getting a bit better exit but um my feeling with the bike is is that it, it works really well um yeah on, particularly on corner entry um mm. carry a lot of a lot of speed on the way in um and that sort of translates a little bit to the middle of the turn as well um I think that um you know uh from a power point of view um the the other one's acceleration maybe isn't quite as strong as the as, as the Duke, 
um, and that might be where it looks like the Duke sort of gets off the turns that little bit better um, because they seem to be able to sort of just square the turns a little bit more and get it picked up onto the top part of the tyre and sort of start the acceleration. That's how it seems to me when I'm behind them. Um, whereas you, with the R1, you've got to really run that like high turn speed, a lot of lean angle um, to try and get the bike to keep the momentum through the turn. You know, you try looking for corner speed. Um, but um, but it does that well. So it's sort of a little bit easy on that type of bike, you know. But uh, the, other, the other thing really is just that I feel like the R1 is something, it's not, uh, it, it, it's a bike that's, uh, it, it's usable. Like it's really user-friendly in terms of everything that you do with it, um, not just from a handling point of view, but also um, from a braking and stopping point, but also the, the, the throttle pickup and, and, and all that type of thing. So um, it seems to be a bike that you can sort of just get on and get up to speed pretty quickly on it because it sort of is, the connection that you have with the bike is um, quite smooth and quite sort of easy to, to use. Um, whereas I, when I look when I look at when I've run behind the Ducatis, it, they, they look a little bit more um, just a, a sense of disconnection, like a little bit little bit more difficult to ride. Um, uh, not not as smooth, not as not as uh, not as easy to sort of make it work. You know, um, that's that's how it looks anyway when I'm behind it. So. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest differences. Yeah, cool. Uh, another question. This relates to, you know, what we see, uh, particularly in MotoGP, there's this thing that if they follow, you know, when they're following, mm. two, there's two impacts that seem to be negative in the MotoGP racing, and that is when they follow too close, they, they, you know, the commentators keep talking about the tyres getting too hot when they mm. follow closely. And the second one is when they're too close and this, this one makes sense to me, you know, they're in that vacuum behind it and the area doesn't work as well. And they get, you know, sucked into a corner kind of thing. The question is, does that following, you know, following closely in the ASBK racing have an effect on the temperature of the tire in the same way it does, or seems to have in MotoGP and does it affect the bike from an aero perspective? Yeah, I I wouldn't say that we really notice much with the tire temperature um, with our races, and I wonder if that's just because our races are maybe a bit shorter, um, so it's not so much of an issue. Um, uh, and I suppose there's not as much force involved um, with our bikes. Like you know, you think about GP, they have a lot more acceleration and deceleration force, um, so they probably can generate they're generating more heat probably in their tires uh anyway so when they went so when if they're already generating so much heat in the tire just because they have they can put so much more force through the tire then uh then when they have a when they when they're around another bike and they they're not getting the cooling effect then mm. it then it you know it boils over and it and it ends up being becoming too hot and over the limit for them yeah. it definitely doesn't seem to be so much of an issue for us um I, i've i've never don't think i've ever really noticed you know, being behind another bike and then overload, you know, overheating the front tire. Um, so no, not really. Um, definitely though, like from an from a you know aerodynamic point of view, um, probably not to the extent that they get it in the GP. It definitely seems to be a lot. They seem to be a lot more affected by it in GP because they have the all the wings and you know all that aero stuff that they have on there. That you know the 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 wind flow. Um, or the the wind has to be, or the the air has to be, kind of still, I suppose, for yeah. it to work optimally. But as soon as you're around another bike, obviously that creates the turbulence, and and they call it dirty air. You know, it's just the the air is not smooth anymore. Um, that affects how the aero works, and it seems to affect them so much. You know, our bikes don't really have so much in the way of the wings and all that kind of stuff on them. Um, but what you do notice is, is that if you're, which is just a, seems to be a common sense type of thing, but if you're drafting someone down a straight in the straight and you go to, you know, get on the brakes at the end of the straight, uh, if you stay in the, in the slipstream where you don't have the, you know, the, the, the wind to help slow you down, you know, you get sucked in, into, you, you just keep following in towards the, the back of the, the bike that's in front of you, um, and that's something that you need to be careful of, particularly at the faster tracks. So, so and, and the faster section. So, like at Sydney, you know, going down the straight into turn one, 
it can happen there. You know, Phillip Island's a bad one for it because the speed's so high. Um, and it's something to be mindful of because, yeah, I mean, you can quite easily get caught out. You go to you go to break it, your usual breaking marker, and next minute you don't have any any you know the 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 wind to to slow you down, and you get sucked into the back of the bike in front of you. Um, but for sure, it's no, it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as bad as a GP bikes. It's a lot more it seems to be a lot more um, predictable, and and you can calculate it a lot easier than than what they can. It's pretty much every time you see in the GP, whenever a or one the riders are really close to each other, especially at the end of the straight. Um, and another rider, you know, with the braking, they always seem to run wide or you know Wouldn't... can't stop for the turn. Yeah, 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 it's really bad. Yeah, I wonder what. Uh, actually, there's probably some data out there how much downforce they have. It'd be quite significant, I believe. Yeah, I reckon it would be. It'd be interesting to know what the numbers are because, um, yeah, I mean that's the whole that my in my opinion that's the whole point of it. You know, you think about when you come onto the straight, they're trying to stop the bike. They've got so much power from the engine that it tries to make it wheelie. You know, so they put all the the aero on it to try and keep the front wheel down, which means they can give it more power and essentially make yeah. it faster in a straight line. So, well, I was talking to Dylan Code about it. You know, from Superbike School, and mm-hmm. and he made an important point, um, and that is that you know under normal conditions, a bike. The lim- the braking of a bike is limited basically by one g of downforce. So in yeah, order right. for that, in order for you to shorten the braking distance, you have to apply more downforce. It has to be more gravitational force downwards, and the yep. only way to do that is with some sort of aero that presses down on the motorbike. So it's greater yeah. g. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's a whole it science. Is. Isn't it? <laughs> it, it it is, and I guess that's why you look at. You look at those teams that are doing so well at the moment, like particularly Ducati and you know even KTM and Aprilia. Like yeah. you look at the aero package on their bike, and they've been developing that for years now. Like I, I don't know when they first started it, but you know, and see the development of it, like to what they have now. It's they wouldn't have spent all that time and effort, and money to yeah. come up with that if it wasn't going to be beneficial. And they, you can you can see it on the track now how much better it is when they now that they've got all that kind of stuff. And they're shifting it from, you know, the, the, the sprung weight, you know, meaning the, the, the panels and the framework and all that to the unsprung part of the bike, you know, the forks and lower part of the, you know, down around the brakes and everything. So that, you know, which makes sense too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like that's the thing now you see in the, the wings there, they're on the mud guards they're on the bottom of the, they're on the bottom of the fork they're around the wheels. It's yeah, it's, it's full on, isn't it? It's funny insane. I wonder when they, you know, they'll have some wings on the back of the rider. It'll be uh, interesting. Not to do a lot of push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> um, the another question is, in the dry, you know, tire wear really be, is a factor. You know, and and we talked about that in round one. You know, you went mm-hmm. out hard and then paid a price at the back end of the race. Um, in the wet, do tires tire wear does that uh, become a factor or not? Um, so, you know, on, on the weekend, not really, um, because the track was quite wet. So when the tracks, um, uh, when the, when the track is very wet, then, and, and like, because our races were, were, were quite short, then not really. Um, but for sure, if the track had been, uh, a little bit drier, then yes, because the tire, the, the wet tires are so soft that, um, you know, if they start generating too much heat into them, well, they just they shred them pretty quickly. So the track the track condition needs to be needs to be correct for them to 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 work and last. And um and uh, so yeah, so keeping the keeping the track completely wet is is sort of important. Um, we were we were very fortunate that it stayed wet the whole the whole race and didn't end up with any dry patches. Um, mm-hmm. But so yeah, for sure. I think it got wetter. Yeah. yeah, it did. It got wetter as the race went on. So yeah, exactly. Um, so we didn't have any issue in terms of uh, you know um, you know wearing out the wet tires there, but you do see it um, in uh, I think the GP and even World Superbike because their races are longer. Um, mm. You know they can have a fully wet race, but they will wear out the tires um, just because their races are so much longer, right. um, and the tires are just that soft. So. Mm. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're just pretty lucky that our races are short enough that, um, that we don't have to worry too much about it at all. Yeah. 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 One last question for you. Um, when you win, are you going to do a stoppy for us? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair I question. Better, I better start practicing, eh? 
<laughs> well, we have high expectations now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I, can't, the bar. I can't say that my 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 expertise is in stunt riding, so <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I'm flat out doing a wheelie on the bike, let alone a stoppy. <laughs> Next time we uh, uh, visiting the the superbike school, I know what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be doing stunt riding instead of uh, instead, <laughs> instead of any other skills. Um, look, I have been very, very gingerly practicing them as I've been coming into the pit lane, and uh, or even even for example, when you when we when we um when we're riding up to the grid. So when you ride up to the grid, just the last the last part of the of the warm up lap to get ready for this the start, you'll just do you know a hard acceleration on the throttle and then a hard braking, and just to try and generate that last little bit of heat in the tires, so that way then it, the tires don't go cold while you're on the grid. And so yeah, do a little bit of a stoppy, but it's it's nothing like a it's nothing like a top rack stoppy. It's probably it's probably yeah. ten centimeters off the ground. We have expectations. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll we'll, we'll, I'll practice. Practice. we'll keep talking about it. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. So I'll keep practicing. Listen, I, I got nothing else, mate. Um, you know, congratulations on you know, we aren't surviving the wet. Uh yep. I appreciate how tricky that would have been. Um and good <laughs> good luck with Queensland Raceway. Um, thank you for taking the time to give us the roundup and uh, really appreciate it. No worries. Yeah, thanks again for having us on here. It's it's bloody great. Hope um yeah, hope people who are listening are enjoying, you know, catching up after the weekend. So yeah, look forward to uh Queensland Raceway. Um, like I said, that'll be the end of end of next month, end of end of April. Um home around there. Uh high expectations for that one. Um hoping to go go there with looking looking to go there with a couple of wins. So We'll uh we'll see how that goes and we'll catch up after the after the weekend. <laughs> you know what I'm be looking for when you win? <laughs> <laughs> A couple of stoppies. <laughs>